Mark Bosco of the Society of Jesus is Vice President for Mission and Ministry at Georgetown University and holds an appointment in the Department of English, prior to which he was on the faculty of Loyola University of Chicago, uh, where there from 2012 to 2017 he was also the director of the Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage. As a scholar, he focuses much of his work on the intersection of theology and art, specifically the British and American Catholic literary tradition. He's published on a number of authors, including the writers Graham Greene and Flannery O'Connor, and he was the co-producer and co-director of this film we just watched, which won the 2019 Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film, and which premiered on PBS earlier this year. Angela O'Donnell is a professor, poet, and writer at Fordham University and serves as associate director of Fordham's Curran Center for American Catholic Studies. Her publications include two books and seven collections of poems, most recently Andalusian Hours, a collection of 101 poems that channel the voice of Flannery O'Connor and love in the time of coronavirus, a pandemic pilgrimage. In addition, she's published a prize-winning mem memoir, Mortal Blessings, and a book of hours based on the practical theology of Flannery O'Connor, The Province of Joy. And her 2015 biography, Flannery O'Connor, Fiction, Fired by Faith, was awarded first prize for excellence in publishing from the Association of Catholic Publishers. Her new critical book on Flannery O'Connor, Radical Ambivalence, Race and Flannery O'Connor, was published by Fordham University Press just last year. I now turn it over to the director of the Boise Center and tonight's moderator, Mark Massa. Yeah, I'm going to ask a couple questions, and then I think, since there are a number of distinguished people in the audience, I'll, I'll, uh, you can ask the real question. So Mark, it took you nine years to make this film. Yes, yes. Was the hard part the beginning or the end? Um, I tell you, it, the hard part was getting it going, just because these are expensive to do. Uh, and uh, so we conceived it, and that it, just two years of thinking about it, but it was really a labor of love. And as we ran out of money, we slowed down. <laughs> as we got more money, we did the next thing. So it really was a kind of, but by the last four years, it started moving faster and faster. Mm -hmm. Angela kind of comes in as, a, as somebody who we interview. All of these people come together in the last four years. But it, it truly was a labor of love and um, uh, learned a lot, learned a lot. So my thing is, you know, as a scholar, all scholars experience this. When you, when you write, when you start a project, you think you know what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And by the end, I always tell my doctoral students, like, you don't know what you're doing <laughs> because, because the project evolves in the course yeah. of doing it. How did your perception of Flannery and her work and her importance change, or did it change, over the course of the nine years? Well, I think I always was in, impressed and almost in awe of Flannery O'Connor's art. But I, I think over the time, I kind of fell in love with Flannery O'Connor, too. Um, <laughs> Hard not to. Yeah, I mean, you, you just feel like you get to, um, to know her, and you're so surprised by her, her wit, her insights, uh, her, her kind of Christian stoicism, I would say, a kind of sense that you know, we have to do this, we go on. Um, I, I think what changed is I thought it was going to be a much more Catholic spent a lot more time on Catholicism. And I invited Elizabeth Kaufman, my, my co-director, who's not Catholic, but it was a documentarian. I'm, I'm just the geek who knows everything about Flannery. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to make a film until I did it with her. And because she wasn't Catholic, it, it opened up a new way of thinking. So the film, I thought, was going to be much more Catholic. And really, it just was maybe, one, I would say, it was one of maybe four elements of the film by the time we balanced it out. So we wanted to talk about her being a woman of the South, uh, making it in a man's world. The, so kind of a kind of a feminist lens, disability with with um, with her lupus became a much more richer thing. Uh, certainly her Catholicism um, and and then race. You know, we 2015 the, this, we things exploded with Black Lives Matter and all of a sudden the film began to change. Uh, we felt we we had to really deep, dig deeper there. Yeah, I mean, I, was, so I always used to assign um, Flannery O'Connor. I, I ran the Catholic Studies program mm -hmm. at Fordham one time. And, and a, you'd, you'd read something, say, "Well, that's what I love." The moment when Al, uh, Alice McDermott reads to the end, of, a, she, says, she points up and says, "Who do you think you are?" Mm -hmm. Alice McDermott looks up and says, "Boy, that's really good." You know, <laughs> that's, that's like, yeah. yeah, and if I could just add on to what Mark was just saying, I think that's really one of the great strengths of the film. Uh, I'm just actually reviewing um, the uh, new film by um, the Word on Fire Institute, mm -hmm. uh, which is an hour long. It's much shorter than this film, but it's, it's totally focused on Flannery's Catholicism. And of course, their mission is to kind of bring people to Christ. That's actually what it says on their website. Um, so it's understandable, but they, anybody who is not a Catholic watching that film is going to feel alienated by, by the focus, whereas I think 
anybody watching this film. This, this is a film for everybody, mm -hmm. as opposed to a film for just a very small audience. So. so Angela, okay, this is addressed to both of you then. Okay, so let's say, I love boxes. I have my students write in boxes, like, like what box goes on top of what box? So <laughs> you had to write a box for Flannery Marie Connor. Is she a woman's writer? Is she a feminist writer? Is she a Southern writer? Is she a Catholic writer? Is she a writer of Southern Gothic? Is she a writer of the Christ haunted South, like Wayne Faulkner? Or is it all those things? She's a great writer. <laughs> um, and what's great about her is, like most great writers, she writes about a particular place and time. She talks about the, the, what a writer has to do is find the intersection of time and eternity. You have to find that place where you are writing about a, a real culture and a real place, but it has to be universal. And it's through the particularity that you're writing about that it becomes universal. Uh, and she captures that so well. I love the way that Richard Rodriguez talks about this in the film. Um, O'Connor's ear is really the key to her stories. You absolutely believe them because this is how people talk in the world that she's writing about. Um, these are exactly the words that they would use. These are the rhythms of their speech. Uh, and so you're entirely yeah. seduced by that world. And I, I lived in the South for a number of the years. I went to graduate school in the South. I lived there for seven years. And then I lived in Baltimore, which is its own odd southern place for 18 <laughs> years. Um, so my ear is attuned to Southern speech, and, and uh, there, there is just this absolute authenticity to the way that O'Connor's stories sound, and also the kinds of characters that she gives us. Um, and, but yet at the same time, um, she, you know, all the stories aspire to this universality. So, um, so I, you know, yes, she is Southern, just as, as um, uh, Tommy, Lee Tommy Lee Jones says, yes, she's more Southern than she is American in some ways. Um, and so there's this very strong flavor of the South, um, but that inevitably is going to lead you into the mystery of being there, but also the, ultimately the mystery of being human. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll pick up on a word. I, I, she transcends the boxes because um, she, her, her, she has a cosmic vision of, mm -hmm. of the person. I mean, that they're made in the image and likeness of God with all their foibles. And so, I mean, so it, and sometimes you can read one story and say, oh, there's a, lot of, there's a feminist critique we can do here. And then there's like, in this story, there's no feminist critique, right? This is, oh, but this is a very religious one. Oh, then you can move back from there. Oh, this, no, this one's the Southern Gothic one. And so she's got threads of it, but I think she transcends all those because her aim is not to ever work out of those ideologies. Her aim is to work out of Thomas Aquinas, <laughs> mm. I mean, when it comes down to it. And so there is this sense of the soul. Uh, there is this sense of a larger vision that's using, she's a craftsman, like Bill, uh, Billy says, Billy mm -hmm. Sessions, she's a craftsman, she'll use anything to make her story, so yeah. I agree. And her subject is the mystery of the human personality, yeah. Yeah. you know, and that's the, the human, not just the southern human, right. so yeah. Right. So Mark, you mentioned that when Black Lives Matter ha happened, um, the question of slandery becomes more complicated. Yeah. Sort of thing. And there's a lot of different responses to that. Um, she's a southern woman, uh, who embraced being a Southern and celebrated being a Southern woman and, all, and appreciated the craziness of where she is of her particular mm -hmm. culture. Uh, do you think she was a racist? Well, I think that she... I'm going to put it out there. No, <laughs> <not a way. laughs> I, I think I could, uh, I think if I qualify it, I'd say that she have lived in a, she breathed the culture of racism as a white person. That if she wasn't awoke to the manners that were going on, she was awoke to the sinfulness of it. She knew that this was not a good thing. Um, so I would say that of her time and of her moment, um, she is struggling with the growing in her knowledge of herself and, and how racism is really a, the great sin, the great burden. So I think, think O'Connor would say that racism is the original sin, right? Mm -hmm. um, but she is embedded in it. She's implicated in it. Um, and she spends a lifetime of friendships and storytelling to try to, to try to grow out of that kind of place. So mm -hmm. that's how I would say it. Yeah, absolutely. She's afflicted by the sin. She doesn't, she doesn't pretend that she can escape yeah. it. Yeah. Um, one of her friends, who was a, a monk at one of the local monasteries where she used to do retreats, said, you know, I would call Flannery a cultural racist. 
She used the language of racism. She used the N-word all the time, as did her mother, um, even though it was a very hurtful word. And although Sally Fitzgerald tries to excuse her from this, there are a number of Southern writers who make it very clear that they did not use that word. William Styron writes about this. Ralph Wood, uh, the great scholar from Baylor uh, of, of Flannery O'Connor, writes about this. It's, this is a word we never would use. It was extremely impolite and extremely rude. And Flannery uses it very often in her letters you know, uncountable numbers of times. Eudora Welty uses it four times. Um, so, so she just, um, Flannery, and, and of course she's very free with language, and, um, and also Flannery is somebody who likes to ignite controversy when she's uh, corresponding with people um, and talking with people. So there's also that to take into account. Um, but I, I agree, I think there is this sense in which she understood that this was a deeply sinful way to be in the world. Um, and she was, you know, very, the title of my book is Radical Ambivalence because even though she knew that that was a problem, she also knew that she suffered from it. And the stories then become a proving ground in which she's constantly trying to strip away the facade from all of her white characters and expose them for the sinful people that they are and expose racism for the horrible institution and the horrible way of looking at the world that it is. Um, but yet, at the same time, even at the same time as she's writing these stories, she's also writing these letters which reveal the fact that she still is afflicted by the sin. So it's, she's, she is as mysterious as anyone so, else. So she's using that language provocative, consciously provocatively then? I mean, to certainly, in, certainly in the title of, of the story. I mean, she you know, really not, they really wanted, did not want to, to publish it that way. They wanted to call it the, the artificial Negro. And she said, no, we're going to do it. Um, so, so I think that regard, I think she lived on a farm, and so I think her manners were going to be a little different because she was not in the town of Milledgeville, but Milledgeville was probably the most notoriously racist city of all of, mm -hmm. of, of, of Georgia. And um, although I think I, I, I would kind of, I would do a little reservation, I, she uses the N-word, but she uses it with the same people. She doesn't use it with everybody. And she uses it as a, as a kind of a way to be on the inside, so she, uh, of a kind of, of a kind of, she uses it with her mother all the time. She, in her, in her letter, she uses with Mariette Lee. Um, but I do think that, um, I do think that it's a, a kind of, yeah, well, I'll just put it there. <laughs> so it was, you and or somebody, her mother, Regina, somebody in the film posits that, that Flannery O'Connor gives her mother as the, as sort of the, yeah, yeah. kind of the point of, of of, of mockery, you know, of, of the person who doesn't get it, the person who consistently does not get it, and therefore is the person who's impossible, who's so thick that it becomes, she becomes the thing. Do you think, do you think that's right? Do you think that Flannery O'Connor was using her mother? <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think the answer is yes. Um, I, I think that, I think that she, she again, she's, she's, she's strategizing how to tell the story of of the sinful race, uh, and in the way that Dante would want to tell it, right? So that there's a kind of a comedy in the midst of, or a redemptive moment. Um, but um, she, her mother is her like she, she and her mother are absolutely opposites. And you know she knows that her mother has to take care of her. She knows she's a good daughter, but at the same time, I think she, I think it comes out in the writing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you know these things are generational. Uh, even though Flannery suffered from racism, she also was the next generation, whereas Regina was formed at a different time uh, and, and doesn't even question her racism, doesn't even think about it. Uh, and so there's this gradual evolution mm -hmm. that's happening, you know, and, and so Flannery is closer to a, a fairer view of human beings. Uh, but nonetheless, she's challenged by the civil rights movement. She's challenged by James Baldwin and Martin Luther King and as she calls him, Cassius Clay. Um, she, she doesn't really want the South to lose its, as she calls it, its flavor, its, mis, its manners, because she thinks that it's going to become like some hellhole like New York, you know? Because <laughs> New Yorkers, of course, are soulless people, right? Um, so she thinks, no, no, I don't want that to happen. Uh, and if we lose these, you know, this mannerly way, she calls it manners, in which you know, black people and white people learn to live together. Uh, but of course, James Baldwin calls it uh, the Southern Kabbalah uh, because it's horrifying and terrifying uh, for a northern black man like himself to go into the South because he doesn't know where the boundaries are. And if he oversteps one, it'll blow up a town. Um, so O'Connor, in her way, and, and this is very typical, of course, of the South at the time and the North, 
um, black people lived in multiple worlds. They lived in their own you know, communities, but then they would go into the white community to work. They would work in people's houses. They understood white people, and they saw them in their everyday life. White people never got to see the way that black people lived. Um, and so one of, of O'Connor's virtues is she knew what she didn't know. And it's one of the reasons that you know, African-American characters in her stories are always looked at from the outside. She never presumes to know mm -hmm. what they're thinking. Uh, and Alice Walker really praises her for this. There's, a, there's an inviolate privacy that she gives to African-American characters that somebody like Faulkner, for example, doesn't give. He pretends he knows what Dilsey is thinking, and, and, and that's very presumptuous of a white man to do. No white writer would do that now. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's called appropriation. And O'Connor knew that when she was writing in the 50s and, and in the early 60s. It's going to be a son of Flannery O'Connor. I mean, it's like, this is like Jaws. So, um, <laughs> Flannery O'Connor is like, almost like a bottomless <laughs> pit of, infer of, of, of wonder and attraction. Would you consider doing a, a follow-up? Mm -hmm. uh, so we have we have about forty-two hours of film in ninety for ninety this ninety-six minutes. It's like killing your children, isn't it? Well, you know, we, we're just going to get down to four hours over a long, long, long weekend. Um, this is before I even left Chicago to come to a, to DC to Georgetown. Um, so I don't know if I would. I don't know if I would do a brand. I, I could, we could. We, there's there's a there's an idea in my head where we would take all the things we have on the stories and we would do short little ten minute kind of little vignettes. Of, of all the things we did. I mean, the, like for example, what's not in this story is we, we did a lot with everything that rises must converge. We have the whole, you know, animation. Which is my, my personal favorite. Yeah, Actually, and we like, had to yeah. take it out. We just, you know, there was, had we one story, but that, that's almost set already as a seven minute, six minute piece, you know? So I don't know if I'd ever want to make, the, you know, yeah, yeah Flannery O'Connor 2 or 2.0, but um, I do think it would be good for, as an educational thing, my hope is to take some of that film maybe get some grad students who want to come to Georgetown and work with me, um, to, to just really kind of go through it and say, this could be a vignette, this could be a vignette. So, and we have a lot more on racism that we didn't use. We have a lot more, we have a lot more on Catholicism that we didn't use. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What would you, if you were to make the film, this is the, the unfair question, that of course, <laughs> when you're reviewing a book, the, the worst book review is, well, I wouldn't have written this book. And I'm like, well, yes, right, you didn't write this book. So if you were to make a film on Flannery O'Connor, and Mark, plug your ears here, okay. Um, <laughs> What would you have emphasized that wasn't emphasized here? You know, that's a really good question. Um, um, I wrote a biography in, in 20, but well, it was published in 2015, but I was writing it several years before that, obviously. Um, and what made sense to me when I was writing the biography was to kind of find each of the episodes of uh, uh, what I thought were the important episodes of O'Connor's life and then key them into one of her stories. Um, and I tried as much as possible to really, you know, have the, tell people the story of her life, of course, because that's why people read a biography, but as much as possible to give them a lot of her, to give them as much of the stories as I possibly could. Um, and so I think I, I probably, I mean, I don't know, I've never met, you know, counted up the number of words that I give over to the story and over to the life, but I think I probably spend more time on the stories than the film does. Um, and, but again, you know, when you're making a film and you have 81 minutes or whatever it is, like you have to make choices, mm -hmm. you know, you can't, um, you can't lavish a lot of time on analyzing a lot of different stories, so you have to make choices. And I think the film makes really smart choices and really good choices. Um, but, um, you know, I could, I could see a version of the film where there's more about the stories um, and a little bit less, you know, maybe about O'Connor, um, you know, the, the circumstances of her life. Um, but again, that would be, a, I don't think there's any one film, you know, to be made or any one biography to be read. This is why we keep on making more films and more biographies. That's why academics are in business. Exactly. <laughs> they writing exactly. the same book. And that's like, it's so, it's so fun to be a poet because it's like, you write one poem and it's like, all right, well, that's fine. Now I'm going to write a hundred more. <laughs> <laughs> and none of them is the same. Um, each of them is worthwhile and worth having. Um, and it, it is itself. Uh, we, we don't just want one of Shakespeare's sonnets, we want all of Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, so there is always, I think, this sense of, you know, something that is ever more about to be, the more possibilities, you know, of, of what you could do with a film, with a biography, with a poem. You want to add anything? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that we wanted, 
my intention always was to get this on something like PBS. So I, I knew the model I wanted. Mm -hmm. So that shaped the form. I wanted. I, I could write about Funny O'Connor, and maybe ten people would read my book. But you know, we had six hundred and seventy-two thousand people watch this on PBS. Mm -hmm. So that's 670,000 people who might pick up a book, read her stories, read her life. And um, so that was the goal. And so um, I think we thought this could do it the best. Yeah. You know, give biography, talk about artists who are so enthralled by her, and then maybe do some deep dives into one of the novels uh, and uh, some of the um, short stories. Mm -hmm. Kim, you're a uh, quite distinguished poet in your own way. Why do you think poets are so attracted to Flannery O'Connor? There's a lot of women writers in general. Mm -hmm. I just heard that she's an artist, she's a very important writer. Mm -hmm. You probably can't hear it. Kim is saying that she's a very important writer for women. Why? Feminist bidness, she says. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she calls it the feminist bidness. The way she uses that, she uses the southern bidness. But uh, so she does comment in her letters about that. Yeah. Um, but the fact that she spoke, you know, in terms of such a unique view, as though you know, I'm not responding, I'm not answering anyone. I think that was really um, I wanted to ask you because you're talking about ambivalence. The hard part of the poem that I didn't know in the story at all was about Baldwin. But she was not only a black northern man, he's a black northern gay man. So there's the yeah. levels of stuff going on there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, as she said, I would be happy to meet him in New York. Yes. That would be fine. Yeah. But not here, because this war, and also she says, I, I have to abide by the rules of the society that I feed on. And I find that metaphor so disturbing, <laughs> because she's like a spy in the enemy country. She's a parasite. She's like sucking all the stories out and putting them out there. As, as uh, Hilton Nall says, she's a reporter. And she's merciless in her inventory of the way that these people live. And, and if she outs herself as some kind of a progressive you know, integrationist, that's it. Nobody's going to talk around her again. Nobody. So in her world, I think that's part of it, that I'm, I'm, I have to adhere to the rules of the world that I'm living in. But also, when you read her letters, um, she, she knows that she lives in Klan country. She knows that they live with terrorists, basically. And the fallout of having James Baldwin come to her house would be tremendous, you know, for her mother, for her, for Baldwin himself. I mean, it's just a very foolish thing when, to do when you have a bunch of rednecks running around with guns and white hoods. You know, it's just, it's not practical. And so Mary Lee is, you know, very, you know, as she always characterizes her as, you know, on, in La La Land somewhere, you know, she's very idealistic, but Flannery is very, very much grounded in the real world, and, and you can't have that happen here. Um, I, and I, I would, I, I totally agree. I would add one thing. Everyone keeps on saying, oh, especially, especially one person, that the same thing about Baldwin, Baldwin. So I did some investigation. I was talking to a couple other people in an African American studies program at DC, and you know, everyone was upset with Baldwin in mm -hmm. 63 and 64. I mean, even Martin Luther King didn't want him around. Mm -hmm. um, would Baldwin just shut up? He's talking about everything. He, 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 literally, you can see these comments from African American, um, uh, pro, you know, uh, prophets of the 60s talking about him this way. Mm -hmm. So when O'Connor says, well, I'd rather listen to Cassius Clay than to Baldwin, I mean, she's got the zeitgeist of more than just being the, a, a white woman who was making kind of a, a maybe a partially racist jibe at him. But I mean, he was just, he was so, 
He was so on everywhere that everyone, even Martin Luther King was like, calm, calm down. He did not want him in, in LA with him. He did, so all of that kind of writing just, it, it doesn't excuse O'Connor, but it does give another reason to think that if she, if he comes to my house, am I validating him over anybody else? And does it change the whole relationship of, the, of how I live in, in, in the community I feed on? Yeah, and, and I think it's very interesting because her relationship to Baldwin changed. At that time, she didn't know much about him when she doesn't want him to come to her house. She said, I read a story by him, and it was a good one. Well, by the time she talks about the pontificate and prophe prophesying kind of new Negro, um, she doesn't like him at all. You know, she no longer is sort of like, I can take or leave him. It's like, no, I don't like this man. And, um, and as Mark says, it's, it's as much because he's a northerner as because he's black, because he, he's from Harlem. She says he can talk about what goes on in Harlem, but he can't talk about what goes on in the South. He doesn't live here. Um, so it's, there's a real sense of that, that he's ignorant, and, and King feels the same way about him. He's, you know, when, when, when there are these rallies and Baldwin wants to speak, King is terrified because he doesn't know what's going to come out of his mouth, you know, and he doesn't want him to be undermining the movement. Um, so, yeah, he definitely was a loose cannon in many yeah. ways, Baldwin. Um, but as you say, this is really not to excuse O'Connor because yeah. in, the, in that letter she talks about the fact, she, she, she says King is not the age's great saint either, um, but he's doing what he has to do as a southerner and also as a pastor. Um, and he has to lead his flock. Um, and she says, I don't know about Ozzie Davis, because Mariette Lee had mentioned Ozzie Davis. She said, you probably like him too, but then again, you probably like all of them. Um, so, you know, the speech is definitely the, the kind of usage that we associate with a particular kind of racist language. Um, so, but then she goes on to say she just loves Cassius Clay. Um, and the reason she does, of course, probably, is because, of course, he's associated with the Muslim, uh, black Muslims, and he's a separatist. Uh, and so is she. She's not an integrationist. So it's like, yeah, he and I agree on this. So, um, so I was actually thinking about that when in, um, in the story, um, Mrs. Turpin says, you know, there's all kinds of them, just like there's all kinds of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a kind of a version of what Flannery thinks, like, okay, here's a whole bunch of um, black intellectuals, activists, different ways that they feel, and this is how I feel about them. She's very frank. And I think it's important that she's writing that letter that you just quoted to Marriott Lee, who's living in Harlem, doing street um, plays, um, street fairs, where they're, they're kind of exploring almost medieval morality plays, but on racism with, with African Americans. So she's a theater person. She's living up in there. In the same letter in which she's kind of doing this kind of rant, which I, I think she only does it with Marriott, and I think she is performing as much as she's um, you know, laying her cards down. She's performing a kind of thing. In that same letter, Marriott Lee has gotten um, threatening phone calls uh, that if you don't stop this, we're going to kill you. And Mary and, and Flannery says, do not stop. Just don't worry about it. You've got to do what you've got to do. So here's a woman who has that kind of racist world, who's telling her best friend, who is a civil rights kind of you know, theater leader in Harlem, don't, you know, don't stop. So there is a sense that the friendship is, again, more universal than all these other kinds of things. Uh, the loyalties are there, are there are so much more important. Um, so she, I, I just find it all fascinating. So in that one letter, you, can, mm -hmm. you get both almost the indictment, but you also get this lovely sense of O'Connor saying, that, that, but that's superfluous. You do what you have to do, honey. You, know, mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to do what you have to do. Yeah, and she does say, um, I think that's the same letter where she says, you know that I'm a segregationist, but, or I'm an, I'm an integrationist by, um, I'm trying to remember the words she uses, by, by, by belief something like that, and, but I'm a, I'm a segregationist by choice. Yeah. And she makes it clear, and she says, and this is really outrageous, this is one of the letters that when I found them in the archives, I was like, whoa, this is so hot, I can't touch it. Uh, it was, you know, I don't like Negroes. Uh, and the more I see of them, the less I like them. And it's like, you know, we all fall in love with Flannery O'Connor, and it's like, Flannery, really? Really, are you saying this? Um, but, you know, she's being very honest, um, and this is, this is the culture that she grew up in. Uh, you asked earlier whether she ever really talked to African-American writers. She lived in the South, as she says, segregation is segregation, where I come from. She did have a friend named Gloria Bremerwell when she was at Iowa, who was a, a black woman. Regina warned her, you should not have a relationship, a friendship. 
um, and, and Flannery, to her credit, said, you can't, you can't tell me what to do. Um, so when Flannery went to Iowa, she had this kind of, her world opened up because it was almost as though you have to get away from home. I think one of our speakers says, that, says this. You have to get away from home in Open order house. to really see it. Yeah. You can't um, know what home is until you leave it. Until right, you leave right. it. And, and she sees that color line that she's been living unconsciously with for all these years. And, and she's actually in class with at least one and probably several African-American writers. Um, and, and she hears their stories. One of them, um, Alfred uh, Nipsom, I think was his name, he used, to, he used to have to drive 30 miles to get his hair cut because he had to find a, bla a barber that would cut a black man's hair. And, and out of that comes this wonderful story, one of her early stories, mm -hmm. part of her master's thesis, is called The Barber. Um, which is about you know all this racist talk in this shop of white people and and the, the black uh, worker who is overhearing all of it and taking it in and taking it in and behaving according to the sort of performative role that his role that he is supposed to have but we know that he's thinking other things so you actually see her waking up to the problem of racism in her native south and writing st working it out the stories are the proving ground for this. Um, and then she gets sent back there to live in it again. Um, and so it's, it's fascinating you know, to me that you know, she has to re take on that role as she re-enters the world of you know, racist people. Um, but she's still trying to work it out in the stories. So hence this bifurcation, this genuine ambivalence, two-mindedness, amb means two, you know, um, of like, OK, this is how I feel, because this is how I was raised. And it's a toxicity that has entered into her as it has most white people probably in the Western world. But at the same time, she knows it's wrong, and she's using the stories to write her way out of it. I want to open the fourth wall up here. Um, <laughs> we have two, two of our stalwarts, uh, two faculty members. We had a Flannery O'Connor reading group, mm. a very smart reading group, uh, two very smart faculty members here, Catherine Cornell and Jeff Leckel. So you start off, since you were you, you sh we showed up for an entire wintry semester <laughs> to read Flannery O'Connor. I just want to follow up actually uh, on what was said before. And do you have any idea why, why Baldwin wanted to meet her? That's one question. He didn't. He, uh, there, we don't have any. I think Marriott Lee was going to try to say, do you want me to do this? And I don't, it never got that far. Okay. And then what struck me was uh, the contrast with her attitude, with her attitude towards her lesbian friend. Lesbian so friends, yeah. yeah. Bi well, one was bisexual, one was lesbian, yeah. So easy uh, for her to get into, you know, what was also obviously culturally unacceptable to uh, to accept that. So the contrast between that and her racism is kind of striking to me. I don't know. Does that come out in any of her writing also? The, the you know, her attitudes towards uh, same-sex. Well, I think I think it says something about O'Connor that you know, two of her best friends, two women friends, um, uh, not only revealed. Well, one revealed their, her love. Uh, Mary Lee kind of revealed her love for her and and got upset with Flannery O'Connor because Flannery O'Connor she thinks spiritualized it, but never you know you, you are my she said my you are my friend but we're going to be friends in this kind of you know spiritual way and and Mary Lee was like no I don't want to do it in the spiritual way so. Um, but she never left her friendships. Um, I mean, and she so she committed to them. I don't think she. I can't remember. Uh, um, I mean, the story of um, Betty Hester. She revealed her her lesbianism as part of their their story. And Betty and Flannery O'Connor was Betty Hester's sponsor for her to become a Catholic. So I mean, so she's her god godmother. I guess she's a godparent. Um, but there is no sense that I don't think there was anything going on. You know, there was no kind of. Let's just say Betty Hester didn't, you know, profess her love uh, in that way. I, th I, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little more conservative than than than, than uh, my my colleague here. I see, I see her working out race in her stories and with really one or two individuals. I don't see her being a race. She is so aware of not to say it, and she's so aware that she's that it's only these other people. I think what 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 the, what these women friends of hers gave her um, was an opportunity. Uh, to share in that in, in, in a woman in a woman's world. I mean, that's how I, I think mm -hmm. she could she could share in a woman's world what she couldn't. She was always. I mean, she's the person who always writes about in, a, in an essay. Instead of about her, she says him. She uses the male pronoun, right? 
Um, and with these women, she could be free of that in some ways. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. No, actually, I was thinking about this while I was watching the film, um, how beautifully the film works out, these relationships mm -hmm. between these women, mm -hmm. among these three women, basically, Betty Hester and um, Flannery, and then, of course, Mariette Lee and Flannery. Mm -hmm that sense of freeness that she feels with mm -hmm. them. Um, her relationships with men really were not very good. You know, she, that Eric Lang Langer um, interview is one of my least favorite interviews <laughs> in the world when he talks about kissing her and saying it feels like, felt like kissing a skeleton. I can just slap him. You know, like, you don't kiss and tell. And, you say, and he says it with this smile on his face. And I just think, like, that is just, just an awful, even if you thought it, it's not really something that you should say. Um, she had a relationship with a, a man uh, when she was in college. He went away to, you know, to fight in World War II, and then he came back and decided to enter the seminary. Well, that was really disappointing. <laughs> um, so she does, in her, in her um, journal that she kept at Iowa, which is so beautiful, the prayer journal, she talks about, at, at one point she talks about, you know, I'm, I'm just so worthless, all I can think of is scotch oatmeal cookies and erotic thought. So she obviously has, you know, erotic impulses. Um, but she, you know, you don't really hear very much about that in her letters. Um, and also, it's in, people often write about this in the stories, that she's, she's not particularly interested or adept at, at re romantic relationships. Um, it's just not something yeah, that the mind really reels of the, interests the, her. A Flannery O'Connor erotic short story. I, 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 I may have to lie down on that one. Like, I think there's a good book to be written on Flannery and Eros. <laughs> no, I don't think there is, actually. Jeff, <laughs> you had a question? Um, Yes, I know. We tried to we tried to interview her and to get her to say why. Well, she has said why in print. She's so cruel with her character. Right, I think right. She's right. Although I like Flannery O'Connor, so I'm wondering what you make of that. Um, is that is that a theological difference? Is that a literary strategy, or is that something regional? Because you're saying that she's just kind of boarding on life. Why is that? Well, first of all, Angela was there with us when we were outside her door, and she wouldn't. We knew she was in the Iowa. She would not talk to us, and I wanted her to say exactly that so that we could have it in the film and, and kind of give texture and problematize. You know, um, I don't think we, it's like every. Well, everybody does kind of worship her in this film in some ways, but they're all artists. They're not, you know, they're not priests or saints or, or bishops. So I would say um, I would I would disagree with Marilyn Robinson. Um, she's a different kind of writer. Uh, and so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. You don't agree that she's hard on her characters? No, I don't. I, she, she, there are stories um, of, of people telling me that she would be laughing out loud uh, uh, when people would come to hear her readings on the rocking chair with a good man is hard to find. And she, that she truly loved her characters. As a matter of fact, whenever she said that she was having a problem with a character uh, in a short story, it's because she didn't feel like she really cared about them enough. So she has a. She has the hard love of, of maybe of, 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 of God in a parable. I mean, they're parables, and so I think it's a myth. It's. I don't mean to be argumentative. I'm yeah. saying she doesn't care about them. I'm saying she, she puts them through a lot. Oh yes, yes, I think that's true. I would say that Marilyn Robinson is mostly right in her in the novels. Mm -hmm. The novels is a kind of a category that Mar that that fits what Mar I think she's talking about her characters. I don't think in a short story that's true. I, I mean, they, it's like they, they, they usually have this happen to themselves, right? And she's got that, she, that kind of observant thing. So, so I, but I'm, I'm, I'm always upset with Robinson because she wouldn't be in our film. So maybe that's part of my answer. Yeah, I was shocked actually when I read in The New Yorker, um, maybe it was The New Yorker, the New Yorker's always got terrible things in it. Uh, but anyway, um, she says something like, There's very, I find very little grace in Flannery O'Connor. It's like, well, you're blind then, because everything is about grace, every single story. And I think part of, it is partly a theological difference, because I love, I, I mean, I love my, my universe is large enough so that I can love Marilyn, uh, Marilyn's novels and I can love Flannery's novels. There are very different kinds of grace. Flannery's is a hard, hard religion that she is she's conveying. There's an easy grace, I think, in, um, in, in Robinson's novels. Um, she she is so so in love with her characters to a fault I think um, the, the, you know, no one can do any wrong even Jack she resuscitates Jack you know the ne'er do well son um, of of Reverend Boughton's friend you know and and that guy's a jerk you know he does all sorts of awful things where's the one where the woman gets shot at the end of it? Um, 
So she always would have been a good woman if there's somebody been there to shoot her every, every minute of her yeah, life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's very much, I mean, Hemingway, that, you know, grace under pressure. It's exactly what Hemingway does, but he doesn't get yelled at for not loving his characters enough. I, so I really think that um, Robinson, I mean, first of all, this is another thing to consider. Flannery casts a very big shadow. Um, for writers, and you know, I'm sure Robinson is a little bit intimidated by her, and you know, so how do I, how do I fend off this huge figure standing behind me? Oh, okay, I'm going to differentiate myself from her as much as possible, and say, well, I'm not doing that. And then also, Billy Sessions uses the word satire at one point, and I think mm -hmm. it's very clear. Even look at her cartoons; she has a great satiric streak, O'Connor. Um, and it and comes off as hard. But mm -hmm. it's satire. It's a different. That's why I think it's a. It's just a category problem mm -hmm. that she has. Yeah. Questions. Jeff. Um, uh, just to follow up on something that Mark had said, a question about about genre. Why the short story, um, mm -hmm. preeminent to me, rather than <clears throat> novels? What was it about the way that she saw it, or the way that she envisioned what she wanted to do that uh, that lent itself to the short story? And perhaps, uh, perhaps a related question. Why couldn't she make money off of her writing? <laughs> yeah. So, either of those. Well, I, I think that the short story was how she, her stories are so tight, like a like a jack in the box that you you, you she, she wants to get everything. I think her her short stories tend to be almost like what a poet does, a poetry does. It kind of makes you do this, as opposed to this kind of kind of going through time, a kind of historical quotidian thing where it's at the end and I, so I think she's best at her thing and I think I do think her Catholic faith gave her lots of kinds of genres and I do think it's a parable like something's overturned she see, she finds that um, she her understanding of insight existential kind of clarity comes with these things um, and, and so I think that's the, the parable is the kind of way that she kind of sees these kinds of moments of, of of human frailty or, or craziness or brokenness or mystery. Um, so I think that's, that's the reason why, really. Uh, I, and she has, a, 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 her imagination is primarily dramatic. Um, I think it's very interesting that when Thomas Merton writes a, a eulogy for Flannery after she dies, he says, I compare her to Sophocles. Sophocles right. um, the, and of course, as we know, Aristotle says, you know, when you're, when you're depicting the fall of a person from a high place, it has to happen fast. It has to be very precipitous in order for the audience to really feel the power of it. And O'Connor could work in that constrained you know, circumstance. Uh, it's much harder to write a short story than it is to write a novel. A novel, you can just meander all over the place, and it's fine. I would have um, made it shorter, but I didn't have the time. The time, exactly. <laughs> where she's like compacts everything so that there's not a sentence, there's not a detail that's out of place. You know, and as we know, you know, it's hardest to write a, a, a poem. That's the shortest of all. The next difficult thing is a short story. The, you know, the yeah. novel's easy by contrast. And um, but she really, she just gravitated to that and and even her novels are very episodic you know they're full of these powerful little episodes rather than you know being yeah, these like this yeah and you have and you have almost like links to it I mean that's why you can read a funny O'Connor story 20 times uh, and the 20th time is because you can read a poem 20 times or you can see that painting 20 times and you always will hit it differently um, yeah so I think that's the I think that's why and in terms of money I, I you know Living in the South uh, and, 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 and short stories didn't pay a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the novels, you know, only made money uh, after her, her death, you know. So I don't know if there's any other. They were made into movies. They probably, like, they probably the, made money in movies. Yeah, when, Later, when, yeah. Houston, when Houston made the, the film, you know, in the 70s, um, you know, O'Connor was dead, you know, almost 13 years, I guess. Right. Um, and that was probably the first time that the estate made money. Right. Really made money. Yeah, if you think of someone like Faulkner, first of all, Faulkner was much more prolific. He had a much longer life. He wrote a lot more books. But in order for him to really make money, he went out to Hollywood and was writing screenplays. Yeah. Um, and so, and then the books would sell, as is always the case. Right. You know, the movies, you know, get made, and then everybody wants to buy the books. Um, so he was able to make a living from it. But it's the rare writer. You know, it's really the rare writer, especially since her books. Let's face it are so weird. You know, nobody knew what to do with yeah. Wise Blood. And then they read The Violent Bear It Away, and that's horrifying. Um, people don't want to read this stuff. They want to read something that's much more entertaining, so. They're trying to make a movie of The Violent Bear It Away right now, uh, so I've been talking to some of those people. And then they're also trying to make a movie uh, using the prayer journal 
uh, so th this, 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 this vignette moment uh, early to, to, to leaving, to her time in Iowa leaving uh, to go to New York. So, um, which I don't know how they're going to do that either. But, and Benedict um, Fitzgerald is working on A Good Man is Hard to the, Find, and, right? Yes, yeah. where the last bit of the story will be her story, but he's doing an hour intro to get there because the para because this is a short story, it's, mm -hmm. it, you know, but you need another hour to kind of extend it. Yeah. A number of you have other questions. I am going to call it an evening, but please join me in thanking our two guest speakers mm -hmm. tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to be with Thank you.